OK, we're now recording. Uh, so welcome everyone to the ALG featured speaker series. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, uh, or if you're watching the recording, thank you for watching. Today we are going to be hearing from Dr. Julie Lacourt at Georgia State University on the Calculus One workbook created for use with the OpenStax Calculus Volume One Open Textbook. Uh, and I believe there are also some pretty cool applets to see as well. If you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to put them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. Uh, Dr. LaCourt, if you're ready, the floor is yours. Thanks, Tiffany. Um, so I'm Julie. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, um, and I'll be presenting my grant work um, for my Calculus One materials. Um, the grant, of course, was provided by Affordable Learning Georgia. Um, I received invaluable assistance from the Office of Grants Development and Administration, OGDA, at Perimeter College. Um, Perimeter College is Georgia State's satellite campuses, and we have a very te heavy teaching load. Uh, a 5-4 load is common. So applying for a grant is a challenge. Um, OGDA will do the grant paperwork for you, which is wonderful. Um, yeah, I'm on a first name basis with the people at that office. And if you use Ogda, you will be too. They're great to work with. Um, I produced Mathemat Mathematica applets, um, a Brightspace module, and a workbook. Um, I first piloted the materials at uh, the beginning of this year, spring 2021, and I continue to use them and uh, fiddle with them. Um, the motivation from the project uh, was came from a formal assessment we gave to our students. Um, a few problem areas where students were seen to be struggling were identified. Um, two of them were uh, finding the limit of a function graphically and um, optimization problems. Um, so I thought these were great uh, opportunities to use applets. Um, when I'm teaching a mathematical concept, I usually have a picture in my head. Um, and I feel like I've succeeded with the students if they can produce a similar picture, an equivalent picture. Um, my picture usually has moving parts in it. Uh, one of the biggest challenges is communing to the student, communicating to the students how the elements of the concept or the problem move. Um, so I thought applets were a great way to do this. Um, finding the limit of a function from its graph um, is obviously a graphical process. Analytic skills can help, um, but with an applet, you can make the experience hands-on. You can appeal to kinesthetic learners by giving them a slider they can move, by letting them click and drag to change the picture, um, et cetera. Um, so that was one class of, of problem, one type of problems uh, I thought would be good to appeal to kinesthetic learning. Um, another class of problems were um, problems that involve strategy, uh, a big picture strategy. Um, students often report getting lost in the technical details of the computations along the way. I thought applets would be a good way to um, provide them with a way to keep track of where they are uh, in the big picture strategy as they work through the computations. Um, for an optimization problem, we can show them all the steps of the process from beginning to end, um, from understanding the problem to um, the, the final solution. Um, so my original plan for the project was just to make a few applets. Uh, it wasn't very ambitious. Um, I wanted the applets to animate, to show moving parts actually in motion. I wanted them to be manipulable, um, let students interact with, uh, have hands-on interaction. Um, and I wanted to facilitate abstraction, um, to facilitate big picture insights um, about multi-part problems like optimization problems. Um, that was my plan, just make a few applets. Um, but then something happened, um, the pandemic happened, uh, and I didn't know whether, and none of us knew whether we'd be seeing our students in person, um, whether they'd be working online or whether we'd be doing something called hybrid teaching 
uh, whatever that meant. Um, I think none of us knew at the time. Um, so just giving the students a few applets no longer seemed uh, sufficient, maybe not even helpful. Uh, it seemed like I, I would just be adding to work uh, that they'd have to be doing on their own. Um, I wanted to now integrate the applets um, and allow students to work through the course material with or without me, um, since I didn't know if I'd be seeing them face to face. So the new plan was to produce, uh, basically to share my lecture notes. Uh, they were already typed. I had to realign them to the course curriculum and the open source textbook. Um, and they also had to be revised to integrate with the applets. Um, the applets appear in the text of this workbook. Um, a student could work through the workbook on their own uh, and, and get a complete Calculus One course. Um, I also felt that I needed to um, up my online game, uh, produce a, a Brightspace course module that was um, presented all the course materials in a way that was easy for the students to find. Um, and I wanted to, whenever possible, design the applets so that they were suitable for unguided uh, or self-guided exploration, um, a sort of sandbox design where students would feel comfortable just playing around and seeing what they could figure out. Um, the timing of the project was a little awkward. Um, the grant funded 2020 to 2021. Of course, spring 2021 was a very difficult semester. Enrollment was terrible. Uh, I only had five students and there was a dicey moment when I thought the class might not make, um, in which case I'd be telling you right now, I made these materials and I've never piloted them. Well, I did pilot them, um, just only with five students. I don't think it would have been meaningful to provide statistics um, assessing the effectiveness of these materials based on those five students. Um, enrollment's come up since then, um, but I don't have statistics to, to, to show the impact um, of these materials uh, at this time. I hope to at some point. Um, once things are a little less pandemic-y and a little more normal. Um, I spent most of my time on the grant work creating the applets and uh, assembling the workbook. I'll present the applets in the workbook um, after a quick look at the other course materials. Um, so iCollege, if you teach at Georgia State, you know what it is. Uh, if not, um, it's Brightspace, it's D2L. Um, iCollege course modules have uh, some notable features. For one thing, they allow any file type to be hosted, which is helpful if you're producing auxiliary materials in some exotic format like Mathematica notebooks. Um, they're persistent. They don't disappear. Um, they're within the instructor's control. Um, it's always an issue when you're hosting materials online. Uh, are they going to stay up? Um, they will in iCollege. And iCollege materials are portable. They can be exported. Uh, shared with other instructors, even in instructors at other schools. Um, let's take a look at what the student will see, um, roughly, what the student will see uh, in the first lesson. Um, since the textbook is open source, it's seamless to link directly to the reading. There's no paywall, there's no paywall, there's no login. They click on that link, they're directly into the reading. Um, links to applets I wrote appear right next to links to applets written by other people or hosted elsewhere. Um, yeah, I think the iCollege uh, course module um, does not increase students' cognitive load too much. It's easy to navigate, easy to see what's involved and how to get there. Um, as for the textbook, we're using the OpenStax calculus textbook. Um, of course, it's free. Um, they just added a feature where you can take notes on the textbook for free also. A print copy is available. Um, 
A student not in my section who was visually impaired uh, requested a Braille copy of the textbook. Uh, I'll say a little more about visually impaired students in a little bit, but um, a, a Braille version is available, um, but takes a while to get a hold of. It takes like 30 days to get, so that's something to keep in mind uh, with these open source materials. Um, the textbook is adequate. Um, it's not the best I've ever seen. It's not the worst. If I'm going to assess a calculus textbook, I look at the definition of the limit. Uh, their presentation is pretty good. But my students were much more interested in the online homework, much more engaged with the homework. Um, for our homework platform, we're using Newton, uh, which features adaptive learning, meaning that if a student is struggling with a certain concept or a certain type of problem, uh, the system will give them problems that target their problem area. Um, it will provide a just-in-time review of concepts going back to elementary algebra if needed. Um, I don't know if you can make out, excuse me, um, I don't know if you can make out how long it took the students to complete this assignment. There's a wide range. Um, uh, I don't know if that student really took five hours on the one assignment, maybe. 168 questions. You can see that the homework will take a very different amount of time depending on how much review the student needs. Um, but I'm pleased to say I haven't heard complaints about that. They appreciate the review by and large. Um, we have a pilot program going on at GSU, at least at Dunwoody campus, um, which gives students free access to Newton. Um, we hope to extend this pilot program for open source calculus to uh, calculus two and three. Um, but at this time, the course, the, the course costs the student nothing in extra materials. Um, when we ask a student to pay $200 for a textbook, uh, that has a very different impact on different students. Um, for some people, $200 is just a number in the, on a screen. It's just a number in their bank account. Others will have to work for it. Uh, at a low paying job. I think it's helpful to remember when we ask students to pay for these things, we're asking some of them to work uh, outside of school um, to get them. Uh, it's something to keep in mind, I feel. Um, so equity means giving people what they need, like textbooks, um, but it also means giving everyone what they need including people who may have issues accessing these materials. Um, access for the visually impaired is something I wanna learn more about, how to make these open source materials more accessible. Um, there are challenges. If you're gonna propose to your department that you wanna use open source materials, uh, I, I, it's helpful to be prepared to answer the question, how will you accommodate visually impaired students? Uh, and of course, there are unplanned for unknowns that, um, I mean, I guess I'll find out when, when I run into them, uh, other concerns I haven't thought of. Um, some administrative concerns you may hear if you're proposing open source materials um, include, uh, who will I call for technical support? Um, it may, you may hear that people want a, representative, a uh, corporate representative that they can contact with issues. Um, it's good to have an answer to that question. Um, and another concern is converting to open source materials is a lot of work. Happily, there are a lot of funding opportunities um, to get compensation for reinventing courses, at least at GSU and certainly in USG. Um, all right, so let's, let's move on to the, the workbook. Um, the lessons um, in the workbook, they're basically my lecture notes, modified, uh, but I developed them over years with a bunch of different textbooks. Um, at this point, I can't vouch for the, or the sources of all this material in the workbook. So I still say, I'm still calling it a draft, and I'm going to call it a draft until I work through the workbook myself and take out all the unsourced materials. Um, and eliminate all the pro proprietary material. All right, on to the applets. Um, there's about, I think there's 30 textbook sections 
uh, that we cover in our class. So a little bit more of a third of those textbook sections, I wrote applets to accompany. Um, breaking these applets up into categories according to how I wanted to use them or how I imagined to use, I'd use them. Uh, some of them were intended for instructor use. Um, the workbook contains screenshots of the applets which the students see in class in motion. Um, if they're interested, they can download those applets and play with them themselves. Um, uh, one of the applets, um, one of the ones I'm happiest with, uh, encourages free exploration. Um, there's no prompting. There's no structured activity associated with this. We'll take a look at this in a minute, in a few minutes. Um, but using this applet, the derivative sandbox, students tended to discover relationships between the graphs of the function and its first and second derivative on their own uh, without guidance. Um, I also had a few self-guided activities that display explicit questions. Um, for example, when we look at the, um, the applet for teaching the definition of the limit of a function, um, the window explicitly asks the student to find a delta satisfying the epsilon challenge and the definition of the limit. Um, the values of um, delta and epsilon and the point at which the limit is being taken can all be manipulated using sliders. We'll, we'll see that in a few minutes. Um, last set of applets, um, I'm calling them strategy guides. I don't know if that's the best name for them. The point of them is to emphasize a big picture strategy. Uh, these applets present multi-part problems uh, worked out um, just sort of the opposite of a flow chart. A flow chart tells you what to do to get the result of each part. This is kind of the opposite. It just shows you the result of each part. Um, in class, I use this um, to structure our work on a problem. We do the calculations ourselves, but they have this visual reminder of where they are in the, in the larger problem uh, at all times while we're working through the calculations. Um, students seem to like these. They say that these help them practice the specific exercises um, they cover and remind them how to organize their work when working different exercises. All right, on to the individual applets. Um, so um, the textbook opens with a tour of limiting processes encountered in Calculus 1. Uh, the first example of a limiting process my students see is exhausting the area of a circle. Um, so within the first few minutes of class, students are exposed to the idea of a process that can be extended indefinitely with an associated error term that approaches zero. Um, this decomposition of a polygon, a regular polygon into triangles obviously foreshadows Riemann sums. Uh, the textbook makes this foreshadowing explicit. Um, and the workbook um, it sort of develops a, a, a consistent visual vocabulary. Um, the same pictures are seen in classes in the workbook. Um, there are certain stylistic elements that are consistent, like the approximations are purple and the thing being approximated is yellow. Um, all right, moving on. Um, the second applet uh, concerns one of the trouble spots we knew about for our students, uh, finding a limit graphically. Um, this applet allows the student or the instructor to move X using a slider. Um, as X moves, the applet updates the distance between F of X and the limit. Uh, the play button, oh, you can't see my arrow, I don't think. Well, anyway, the play button um, oh, and animates this picture. Um, there's a direction allowing you to um, reverse the direction X is traveling in. We can speed up and slow down the animation as well with those controls at the top of the applet. This is all built into Mathematica. None of this was required any extra effort to, for me to code the animation controls. Um, being able to move X and the corresponding point on the graph simultaneously with a slider significantly reduces hand waving by the instructor. 
um, when I'm explaining this concept without the applet, I always find myself pointing and, and gesticulating. The applet seems to be much more effective at communicating uh, how the moving parts are related. Um, so those first two applets were basically for me to present in class. Um, the first applet students were expected to experiment with is published on Wolfram's website. Wolfram is the publisher of Mathematica. Uh, Mathematica is the language these applets were written in. Um, from their website, you can download the notebook file. That's the source code. To run it or edit it, you need Mathematica, which is an expensive piece of proprietary software. Um, Georgia State students have access to it, um, can download it for themselves at home. Um, so there's no additional cost at Georgia State for Mathematica. But there's also a, um, uh, a version of the notebook called the CDF that requires only a free player. And that's what I distribute to them through iCollege. So they don't have to, well, it's a much smaller download for one thing, and it's free. Um, the workbook lesson on the formal definition of the limit uh, relies heavily on applets, two applets. Um, in a face-to-face -face class, um, I would typically begin the lesson on the formal definition of a limit by talking about how to interpret an inequality um, of the type encountered in the definition of the limit. Um, I usually use a number line and a piece of string. Now, um, in a hybrid teaching model, um, I didn't know if I'd be there to do that for them, to show them with the string. So the workbook tries to walk the students through as close as I could get to the classroom experience. It actually asks them to imagine taking a string, or I think it says, yeah, it says to actually take a piece of string and do what I would have done in class. Um, in class, I, the next step would be to mislead the students and to incorrectly guess, guessing the value of a certain limit. Um, the point of this example is to demonstrate that we need a formal definition of the limit. Um, the informal definition can be misleading. <coughs> Excuse me. The workbook, again, walks through the student what I would have done in person. Um, so in person, um, I put this up on the projector, this applet, and let it play as an animation at very, very slow speed while we discuss what they think the limit is as X approaches zero. Um, X is moving very slowly and we just, we're just chatting. We're talking about the fact that the limit has to be a single number if it exists. We talk about the fact that the function seems to take on the values one and negative one again and again as zero as x approaches zero uh, as we're talking suspense builds um, and it soon becomes obvious that the value of f of x is not homing in on any single number of course f of x as x gets close to zero is moving very quickly um, and they can see that developing as we're talking um, we then move to an applet that demonstrates the definition of the limit. Now, the, the applets I've presented so far, these are not uh, unique. You, you can find a million versions of an applet um, showing the definition of the limit, but um, there's a certain consistency, a certain visual consistency in having all the applets authored by the same person um, that, that I think is, is provides a real value. Um, so, uh, what I would say in person is pretty much what appears in the workbook. Um, in person, I would have a dialogue. Well, how near do we want the function to be to the limit and, and so on? Um, I ask the students to do what I would have done in class in the workbook. Um, so they get some, some reasonable simulation of a classroom presentation. Um, when I wrote this applet, I imagined having a student working the controls while I'm guiding the discussion in the class. And we're asking the student to, to, to do what's needed as we get there in the discussion. Um, that wasn't really, uh, I didn't feel that was safe uh, during the worst of the pandemic. Um, so I played that role of running the controls. Um, I asked the students to find a delta that works for the epsilon shown. Um, 
a slider can be used to control delta, um, shrink it so that um, we satisfy the definition of the, of the limit for that epsilon. Um, and the change in color from red to green indicates a suitable delta has been found. Um, Uh, this applet has a removable discontinuity, something I didn't see in most of the available applets online um, to facilitate discussion, the discussion of uh, the case where the limit is not equal to the value of the function. Um, I don't have statistics showing the effectiveness of these applets, but I can tell you that uh, for the first time in, in a, almost 15 years of teaching, um, most students got a question like this correct. We're able to say uh, for what range of x values um, f of x is within some tolerance of its, uh, well, <laughs> of its limit uh, what x is for. Um, so uh, the next applet I wanted to look at is called the derivative sandbox. This is the most open uh, an exploratory applet. Um, when the student runs it, this is what they see. Uh, this, by the way, is a, a picture of the Mathematica notebook. This is what you would download. This is available for download on Wolfram now. Um, this is what you would see, all this awful code, um, but the applet would already be running and ready for use. Um, what this applet allows us to do is to grab a hold of these crosshairs and bend the curve. Now, the student quickly discovers um, that orange dots are appearing on the graph. Um, they can show the graph of the derivative. Um, and without any coaching, um, just by playing around with this, uh, students are able to draw conclusions about the relationship of the turning points uh, of the graph and the zeros of its derivative. There are a few presets here, uh, a linear, quadratic, uh, et cetera, um, function to get students started uh, playing around um, with this. Um, I've used this not only in class, but in office hours um, to verify that students uh, can predict what's gonna happen to the derivative when they change the graph of the original function. Um, okay, so some of the applets are, um, it wouldn't be obvious at all what they were for. Um, the next one is one of those. Um, so in a standalone document, I list the learning objectives I had in mind for each applet. So if anybody ever wants to use these materials, they have some idea what I was aiming for. Um, this example is used to introduce the chain rule to motivate the formula, which students have trouble remembering. Um, it, uh, first I ask them to guess, and they don't know the chain rule yet, guess the derivative of sine of x minus one. Um, and using our understanding of tangent lines um, to verify their guess, um, we're able to convince ourselves that it's plausible the derivative here is cosine of uh, x minus one. Um, I then ask them what happens if we speed up sine of x? Uh, with the slider, I can control the frequency of the sinusoidal. Um, so as that, uh, as the coefficient increases, students can see the tangent at z x equals zero grow steeper. Um, I finally ended up with it, the, the frequency doubled. I asked them what do they think the derivative of the green function is, um, and uh, then show them. Um, if they want a hint, um, I mentioned that the tangent at zero to the sped up sinusoidal is twice as steep. Um, and we do a little work to, to prepare the way for this. So this is not all uh, brand new material with the tangent lines and so on. Um, uh, this next applet um, provides motivation for the inverse function theorem. Um, We don't have time in class 
to reteach inverse functions fully. Um, we may have a few minutes to review the construction of the graph of the inverse function from the graph of the original. Um, but with an applet, we can present an enormous amount of information visually uh, in very little time, uh, refreshing their memory and identifying um, areas that they may need to look more deeply into. Uh, so in this applet, I can quickly talk about the a point, a, gra a point on the graph of F and the corresponding point on the graph of its inverse. We can see that the coordinates are transposed. Um, and I also built in a just-in-time review of what the graph of F inverse looks like, how to construct it. Um, so we click one button to set this reflect, set up this construction. The second slider, draw the reflection, traces out the orange graph, the graph of the inverse, uh, as if drawn by a pencil at the moving point F of A A. Um, once the graph of F and F graphs of F and F inverse are both visible, um, we start looking at tangent lines at corresponding points. Um, the relationship between the slopes of the tangent lines is easy to see in the picture, uh, easy to explain just using delta X and delta Y, no more confusing notation than that. Um, and we can even see why uh, the inverse function theorem forbids the tangent to F at A from having a horizontal slope. Um, when a vertical slope appears on the inverse functions graph, uh, the tangent line disappears. And that gives us an opportunity to discuss why the tangent line is not defined uh, at the, the point on the orange graph indicated. Um, applets allow us to show students uh, a picture of pictures of concepts that are beyond the scope of the course, um, but nonetheless motivate course material without bothering the students with unnecessary technical details. Um, when I teach the linear approximation of a function, um, I tell the students that the point of tangency matters, uh, that the goodness of the approximation depends on the tangent point. Um, but in this applet, they can actually see it. They can actually see the range of X values for which the approximation is good enough. They can see how good enough is defined by uh, playing with the epsilon slider. And there's no need to define epsilon neighborhoods of functions, uh, which is what I'm thinking, in order to see stu to help students see that uh, the goodness of an approximation depends on the tangent. Um, all right, uh, so we're, now we're moving into the um, what, what I call the strategy guides for lack of a better name. Uh, these emphasize the big picture strategy for multi-part problems. Um, this applet uh, has four different problems. Um, where students are asked to find the critical numbers. Each step in the process um, can be revealed and hidden with checkboxes. Um, and that's all this applet does. Uh, there's nothing more to it. It's just the graph of the function and the results of each step of the process of finding critical numbers. The functions I chose each require very different technical skills. So one has a trig function involved. Um, uh, they, there's varying levels of algebraic uh, intensity uh, to each of these calculations. Um, we use this in class as an outline to keep track of where we are in the problem. Students can use this on their own to practice these problems, see if they can do the calculations to each step on their own. Um, Students report that this does help them keep in mind the general strategy for finding critical numbers. Um, if there's a theme to this presentation, I guess it's reducing the student's cognitive load. Um, it's easy to see what the mean value theorem has to say about secant lines and tangent lines than it is to say it in the language and symbols available to the 
average calculus one student um, saying the average rate of change over the interval is equal to the instantaneous, uh, you've already lost them. Um, they need to understand that, but by showing them visually first, showing the construction visually first, and providing them with the ability to move stuff around and ask questions like, what if A is on the other side of B? It makes it a lot easier to uh, under, to, to well, um, it, it's easier, it's easy to get the intuition and then the work of understanding the language they're expected to master um, to express the same idea. Um, so another uh, known problem spot for our students was finding intervals of increase and decrease. Uh, this is a picture of the workbook page. Um, in order to look at the applet, I have to say a little something about how I uh, how I teach uh, finding intervals of increase and decrease. Um, I'm sure how a lot of people teach this. Um, I teach them to uh, teach the students to uh, construct a sign chart for the derivative. Um, this process of uh, constructing a sign chart, identifying where the critical numbers are, partitioning the number line into intervals, and then picking a test point for each interval. This process can be made tactile and visual using an applet. Um, in this applet, um, students are presented with the graph of a function um, and an interval representing the sign chart of the derivative. Uh, the buttons allow them to add um, interval endpoints. Those endpoints initially are placed randomly, so the student has to move them to where they're supposed to be. So here we have it moved to the turning point. Um, when a test point is added, the sign of the derivative is represented by a blue or red point. Um, the students will come to find out that these points are points on the graph of the derivative, but when we're working the problem for the first time, I tell them just look for the color. The color tells you the sign uh, that you were looking for in the sign chart. Um, yeah, I tell the students it's like playing Battleship if anybody knows what Battleship is. Um, yeah, the large crosshairs here are interval endpoints. Um, they show up as ticks on the x-axis. The small crosshairs are the test points. Um, and in class, working with this applet, it, it, it feels a little like playing a game. Uh, we know what the graph of f looks like from the start, but I tell the students our goal is to convince someone who can't see the graph where the intervals of increase and decrease are using calculus. Um, at this time, I have four of these exercises worked up as applets. It's very easy to change the function for new exercises. Of course, the students are expected to solve these problems by hand, doing all the technical calculations, but I feel this applet um, really helps cement what the process is, uh, the general strategy for solving these problems. Um, so this is the last um, last applet, or there's three of these optimization problems, but um, last set of applets I want to talk about. Um, this is a problem I stole from a conference right before the pandemic. Um, instructors were handing out pipe cleaners to the student and asking them to maximize the area, you know, maximize the rectangular area uh, using the pipe cleaner. Um, as the perimeter, the perimeter of the rectangle. Um, all our optimization problems in Calculus 1 can be solved using the same general strategy, uh, but students often lose sight of the purpose of each step when their, their thinking process is not grounded in the facts of the problem. Um, in this applet, and then there's two more optimization problems, I introduce a general strategy to the students. First comes understanding the problem. Um, here you see, uh, so the question is, I don't know if you can read this. The question is an eight inch long pipe cleaner is bent into the shape of a rectangle. What are the dimensions of the rectangle with maximum area? Uh, the slider at the top controls uh, W, the length of the red side. Um, students can see how the, the, the bend points, uh, the, the points where they're going to bend the pipe cleaner, 
bend the pipe cleaner into a rectangle move. Um, once we've understood the problem, the next step is to identify the quantity to be optimized. Um, so in class, we talk a little bit and in the, in the workbook, it you know, goes through how do you get this expression for the quantity to be optimized. Um, and when we're ready, we reveal the graph of the quantity to be optimized, the area function. Um, even if a student were to work through a problem like this and get stuck at some point along the way on some part of the technical calculation, um, let's see, where did I have that? So, uh, here's another example. Even if they get stuck on some part of the calculation, um, by manipulating the um, slider, uh, they can figure out an approximate solution, even if they got tripped up on the calculations. Um, so the second one is um, the second optimization problem is maximizing the area of a rectangle inscribed in a semicircle. Um, when we get to the second optimization problem, I introduce another part of the general strategy, writing a legend. I ask the students to identify their variables and say in words what they represent um, so that we all have the same uh, legend um, uh, I can use this applet to show them what the legend would be um, I used to teach this the optimization problems using group work I had the students come up with the legends on their own uh, and then present them to the class um, <sighs> It's hard to get students motivated for group work right now um, at this moment in time. Uh, at least it has been for me, and I don't want to force them. Um, so with this applet, I can ask the students to work individually on the problem with that common legend, um, and then we can discuss it and compare our solutions. Um, Uh, I think this is the very last applet I wanted to look at. Um, last optimization problem. Uh, it asks the student to minimize the vertical distance between these two graphs. Um, when I taught this before using applets, it was a challenge to get students to understand what I meant by the vertical distance between two graphs. That concept put a little bit of cognitive load on them. Uh, this applet allows us to not just see the vertical distance between two graphs, but also to see that it is a function of X. Uh, the slider moves X um, and it becomes obvious to the students quickly um, that that vertical distance depends on X and can be minimized. They can even eyeball about, about where, uh, about for what X, uh, that distance would be minimized. They also see the need for calculus to find the exact place where the distance is minimized because it, it's impossible to eyeball it accurately. Uh, again, if they get stuck along the way on a calculation, they can use the applet to manipulate x uh, and on the graph of q of x, the quantity be, to be minimized, um, they can see where that quantity is minimized just by moving x. Um, get a feel for the problem even if they got stuck on one of the parts. Um, so at this point, um, applets accompany most lessons. That's not quite right. About half the lessons, uh, have applets associated with them. Um, uh, I've taken applets from other authors, uh, and included them in my, uh, iCollege Brightspace course module. Um, I downloaded them from Wolfram's demonstration project. Um, resources posted to Wolfram's demonstration project are pretty permanent. They tend not to be taken down, which is a good thing. Um, however, some of my links uh, just died. Um, so, I, and I found out they died when I was teaching. So I would just say, I would caution anyone um, from linking to resources where you're not sure if they're gonna be there in a year in a month even. Um, I think that's a, you know, dead links and lesson plans are a compelling reason to advocate for institutional repositories um, 
uh, for open source materials um, like OpenALG. Uh, so I'll just quickly tear through these um, these remixes of other people's applets. Um, the applets available for download from Wolfram um, can be edited, uh, uh, modified. In a lot of these cases, I just took out detail that I didn't want uh, to distract my students with. Um, uh, uh, this is an interesting one. This is basically a test bank. It gives manufacturers problems like this, uh, making a piecewise making a a piecewise defined function differentiable. Um, uh, this is a great applet, but uh, the link doesn't always work. I intend to write one of these myself, so I don't have to depend on other people's links. I'm sure there's another version of it somewhere. I should find one. Um, this is a neat one because high school students wrote it. Um, it's nice to present this to the students to encourage them if they're interested in, in coding, uh, encourage them to uh, explore Mathematica themselves. Um, all right, uh, well, I'm almost done. Um, so just a couple things about distribution I wanted to mention. Um, so these applets written in Mathematica, which is software published by Wolfram. Wolfram uh, has this website, the Wolfram Demonstrations Project, where you can upload your applets and notebooks. Um, it's got some pros and cons. Um, the pros are it's a fairly reliable link. Um, I've seen these links last for 10 years in some cases. Um, um, and it lets you, of course, share your work with other educators and Mathematica users. Um, some drawbacks. Uh, the biggest one for me was that it's privately curated, and so they may reject some of your submissions. Some of my applets um, were intended for use in the classroom. It's not clear how they would be generally useful without some explanatory text. Um, if your applet is deemed not useful enough, or if it's deemed redundant, like there's, they already have applets to do that, uh, Wolfram may not publish it. Um, so if you're trying to present a unified experience, um, Wolfram is probably not the place to host your materials. Um, also, you can't host non-mathematic materials on Wolfram's site. Um, and that's obviously a drawback because it, for the students, it's nice to have everything in one place. Um, OpenALG um, uh, is a wonderful uh, resource. Um, it gives the educator control over how content is presented. It lets it allows you to upload various file types um, as a single project. So someone who's interested can download it all at once. Um, you can attach explanatory notes, learning objectives, etc. Um, the only bad thing I could think about OpenALG is it's not really a bad thing. It's it's not Brightspace. You know, it's not suitable for giving to your students as part of the course, perhaps, you know, unless you want to just let them download all your materials at once. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm very happy with OpenALG and, and very glad we have it as an alternative um, to uh, proprietary, uh, privately run repositories. All right, um, that's all I got. Uh, any questions? Um, thank you, that was great. Um, we do have a question in the chat uh, from uh, Dr. Marion. Uh, Julie, I really like the concept and idea. Normally the Mathematica is not free. I understand that you have to prepare the applet by using Mathematica. Can students use the applet without the Mathematica software? They can. Um, they, I distribute something called a CDF. Um, it's a version of the applet that doesn't require full Mathematica. There's a free player called Wolfram CDF player, um, and they can download that. The only thing I don't like is they can't do it on their phone. That would be super cool, but they still need a PC to do it, but they don't have to pay for full Mathematica to use the applet. So 
So you said it was um, a Wolfram, like a CDF viewer? Wolfram CDF player. Okay, sorry, I'm writing that down. I'm, I'm actually very interested in this. My my husband is a math person and <laughs> is, I was showing him uh, some of your stuff. Um, and yeah, then, of course, GeoGebra is a is a good alternative. It doesn't. Uh, I'm not expert enough with it to make it produce full applet functionality. Um, but GeoGebra is a, a good alternative. It doesn't require any software to be purchased at all. Cool. We'll have to look into that. Um, I actually had a question. Um, what kinds of like what skills did you need to create the applets? Um, like, is there a particular uh, coding language or something that you have to use, or is it something that's like a WYSIWYG kind of editor in Mathematica? Um, it is code. Um, uh, Mathematica is its own language, so here's a look at the code. This is very scary looking though. Uh, it doesn't have to be this complicated. This was a tough one to write. Um, I would say that anybody who knows a coding language can pick up Mathematica pretty quickly. Um, a lot of this functionality you're seeing is built into something called a manipulate, um, which is very easy to make. Um, so I'm, I'm making one right now. It's gonna be real dumb. But that's all it takes to produce a slider. Um, if I wanted to show like something changing, right? It is very simple to get started. It is coding, um, but it's a pretty easy language to get started in. And you can, of course, download somebody else's source code and modify it, use it as a starting point. Great, thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions? Uh, you can put them in the chat or I can actually go ahead and enable microphones now. OK, uh, attendees can now use your microphone if you are interested in uh, chatting through voice. Hello. Hello. Uh, hi. Uh, so I want to know. Usually, um, if the university, I know that Georgia State has the mathematical license for all students and everyone on campus. But if the university doesn't have the mathematical, uh, license, so do you think we will still be able to do the uh still use the applet? Okay. Yes, yes. Um, the Wolfram CDF player does not require a site license. It's a free download um, and it can run the applets um, as is. Yeah. Um, if you want to create your own applet or edit existing applets, for that, you're going to need the full version of Mathematica which you can usually get as an editor, as an educator, um, even if the school doesn't provide a site license to all the students. Did that answer your question? OK, so so you mean, uh, can you let me know again, what's that called, CFD? It is Wolfram uh, CDF. CDF. Oh, Dr. Mary, and I put a link in the chat too to get to the player. Oh, okay. Thank you. No okay. And uh, you said that uh, they have like a for educator also, right? Yeah. The last time I had to pay out of pocket <laughs> for Mathematica, it was um, it was like fifty dollars or a hundred dollars as a graduate student. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, but the department, my, your department may be able to get you, uh, your department or your institution may be able to get you 
a license as an educator uh, pay uh -huh. for employee. Yeah, for 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 us, uh, I think it's okay. We can pay, but I just want to know. Let's say if we prepare, if we create it, then student can use it for free. They don't need to rely on that. But like what you said, we can uh, we can still do it by using the CD CDF payer, right? That's right. That's okay. Right. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Sure. So I see on the uh uh manifold um open alg site uh that we have dot nb files um is that the editable version or um is there yes those are the editable versions that require full mathematica i mean hearing that there's interest i will make sure to put the cdfs up there too yeah that would be fantastic um yeah, I, I think I think there are definitely uh, people who would be interested in uh, using the applets that you've created in their classes. Um, so that would be great. All right. Yeah, a lot of them I already have made. A few of them I'll, uh, I'll, I'll make the rest of them. <laughs> uh, there's a couple I need to make. Okay, yeah. That'd be great. Do we have any other questions? Again, feel free to use the chat or the microphone. Okay. I'm not seeing anyone typing, um, but again, you know, feel free to cut me off if you're uh, if you are trying to ask a question right now. Um, but uh, I'll say this: this was really great. Um, it was very informative. I I am not a math major or anything. I haven't taken math in a very long time, but I was very very interested in this um, presentation and project. Um, it's it's given me a lot of ideas for. Uh, recommendations for uh, different uh, math teams doing grants. So um, this is really great. Um, if we don't have any other questions, do you have anything you want to say before I end the recording? Um, no, I don't think so. OK, well, thank you very much again, um, and I'll go ahead and turn off the recording now. All right.